Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to look at verse 19 um, through the end of the chapter, verse 23. And I'm going to just, uh, actually I'll start reading from verse 15, but we're going to look at uh, verse 19 through 23. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward those who believe according to the working in of his mighty power. So that's the next thing he's praying for. And what is that they may know the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the power of his mighty work, that the power of the Lord may be evident and felt in our lives. Uh, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with thee always, even to the end of this age, into the end of the age. Amen. So he sends them off, gives, gives them the great commission. But before he does, he tells them all authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. And he ends that by saying, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So based on that fact that all authority has been given to him, he sends them off. And you think about what they're thinking. Wow, like he sends them off telling them that he has all authority. All power is his. Second Chronicles 14 verse 11. It says, And Asa cried out to the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on on you and in your name we go against this multitude O lord O lord you are our god do not let man prevail against you and that faith that that same faith that uh jonathan had in first samuel 14 6 then jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor come let us go over to the garrison of the uncircumcised it may be that the lord will work for us for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. See, these men were outnumbered, but they trusted in the Lord. They knew that if the Lord's doing the fighting, nothing can stop him. Multiple times uh, in Genesis, whenever God tells Abraham that him and Sarah are going to have a child, and Sarah laughs, and, and he says, is anything too hard for me? In Jeremiah, multiple times he says, is anything too hard for the Lord? Nothing is too hard for the Lord. And if the Lord's doing the battle... He can save by one person. He can save by many. He can save by himself. Nothing's too hard for him. And that's what Paul's praying, that you may experience that power, God's power in your life. Romans 8, 13, 31, I mean, uh, Romans eight thirty one. it says, If God be for us, who can be against us? And, and you, you just think about that, seeing God's power. And, and, if, and if there's one person that can say that, it, it's Paul. And that's what he's praying for them. Again, in Second uh, Chronicles, um, chapter sixteen, verse nine: For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, to show Himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to Him. So God is looking through all the earth, seeking to show Himself strong through those whose hearts are loyal to Him, and don't. We all want to be those that God shows himself strong. And that's something that should be constantly in our prayers. And that's something that's only going to come by obedience to him, by seeking him, seeking his will, dying to yourself, <clears throat> and denying yourself, pick up your cross and following him. Because when you do those things, now you're going to want his, desire, his plan and his work to be done in your life. And whenever you submit your life your will to his will then you will begin to experience God's working in your life then he begins to do the things that he wants to do all along so that's the seeking him obedience to him and, and as you seek him seek his will for your life because he wants to do, we talk about revival right we want a revival to happen we want to see many people get saved well God wants to see those things too he wants 
to show himself strong. And I pray that we be those people that he does show himself strong in our lives. And that is going to come again through seeking him in obedience, dying to yourself. He goes on in verse 20 which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things, the church, which is the, his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to us. And that's what Paul was praying, that God, that they may know God's power in their life. And um, he ends it by saying that he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. We're his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And we get to experience the fullness of Christ like no other when we're with the body. We are the body. And he is the head, and we can enjoy that fullness again, and and his headship when we are with the body. Um, so the more closely, you know, there's people that say that, you know, well, I don't need to go to church. You know, uh, I'm a Christian, but I don't really need to go to church. <coughs> Jesus said, uh, "Our Father who art in heaven," right? He didn't say, "My Father." He, of course, he does make it personal at, at many times and says, "My Father," but. In that sense, he's saying God is our Father. God is the Father of us who believe. Uh, John one twelve says. So, we don't need the church to get saved, but we do need the church for sanctification, for fellowship, for to lift us up, for uh, spiritual battles, uh, for many things. Uh, the more closely we're linked to the body, the more closely we'll experience the authority of Jesus's headship. And how, so if Jesus or if the church is the fullness of him, which fills all in all, how can we be full of the Lord? The church is where the headship of Jesus will be enjoyed. And, and that's what he's saying. <clears throat> and again, they, if people say, I don't need the church, I can study the Bible on my own. But that's not the heart, the heart of the father. Imagine if a father went, came home from work and he told his kids, all right, kids, everybody grab a plate and you go to your room and, and y'all go eat by yourselves. Um, yeah, I mean, they'll get nutrition. They'll get fed. They'll be full. They'll survive. But the heart of a true father is to see his kids together, interacting, loving, sharing, and growing with each other. And, um, and that's the beauty of the local church. There's so many believers around the world that they they get a, it's a it's a high price to go to church and you can get persecuted and here in America we take it for granted <clears throat> if you're not part of a body you need to be f part of the body that you may f experience the fullness of Christ in a more full and uh real way